Hello, my name is Carolina, and today I'm going to give you an introduction to FreeSurfer. So before we start, I want to make uh, some disclosures. First of all, I'm not affiliated or collaborating with the Martino Center and the FreeSurfer team at Harvard University, who are the creators of FreeSurfer. Everything that I'm going to be teaching you and talking about is, uh, is based on my own experience. The illustrations were obtained from FreeSurfer wikis and other external sources. And finally, the brain images were provided by the investigators from the Econ School of Medicine and Mount Sinai in New York, where I currently work. Other than that, I have nothing to disclose. The agenda for today is going to be divided into two main sections. First, I want to give you a brief a theoretical introduction to what FreeSurfer is and the differences between volume-based and surface-based morphometry, how to set up your computer to be able to run FreeSurfer, how to download FreeSurfer and set up your data to use it in with FreeSurfer. And in the second section, we're gonna talk about the main FreeSurfer command, which is recon all, uh, followed by kind of looking at the output, correct, checking for errors and correcting for errors. Along the way, I'm gonna be giving you some tips and tricks um, for the past four years, I've been using FreeSurfer and I have processed more than 600 structural MRIs. And so I have a couple of tips and tricks that could be useful. Before we start, uh, don't worry if you're new to FreeSurfer. It can be a little bit intimidating at first, at least it was for me. However, there are some here are some helpful tips that can get you started. First of all, start by processing one subject at a time. And once you feel comfortable with that, move on to running them on batch. Uh, second, the best way to learn is by actually doing it. So experiment with different commands and different type of data. Always, always, always visualize your results, check the output and also the input to make sure it looks good and it is what you're expecting. Save your work, that's obvious. And finally, FreeSurfer has a ton of powerful commands that can help you get the most out of your data. So please check out the documentation and experiment with different options. And I'm, this is really useful when you're debugging and correcting for errors. FreeSurfer provides a bunch of examples and ways um, that you can, or like commands that you can use to correct some of the typical errors. Finally, remember that learning free surfer takes time and practice, so don't get discouraged if things don't go smoothly at first. And again, I just want to emphasize that you should always, always visualize your results, your results. And this is not only for free surfer, but every time you're using any neuroimaging software, you should always check and, and visualize your results. So what is free surfer? FreeSurfer is a software package that was created for the analysis and visualization of structural and functional neuroimaging data. It creates a 2D reconstruction of the brain, and this is different to other softwares that create a 3D reconstruction. It labels cortical and subcortical regions and it characterizes them in terms of volume, thickness, area, and curvature. It has pipelines for cross-sectional and longitudinal analysis. It provides um, commands to use multimodal to use and process multimodal neuroimaging, such as fMRI, diffusion, PET, EEG, MEG. You can do both single subject and group level analysis using FreeSurfer, and it has some limitation. One of them, one limitations. One of them is that it's not ideal um, when you have scans from children that are uh, younger than five years old. In a nutshell. And the, one of the take home messages is that FreeSurfer provides measures of volume and thickness of cortical and subcortical sub structures. It has both cross sectional and pipelines, and you can process and analyze single subject and group level analysis. And here are some examples of the images that you will obtain uh, after, you know, when using FreeSurfer. The first three are typical label, subcortical and cortical labeling of the brain. And the fourth image is uh, the results of a group analysis between probability disease and control showing the areas that were significantly different between groups. 
So how does Free Surfer work? To understand how Free Surfer labels and characterizes each one of these structures, we have to talk about something called partial voluming effects. So most of this neuroimaging software, the way they work is that they obtain or they measure, they characterize each voxel in the brain. And a voxel is basically a 3D pixel. So if we divide the brain into voxels or into pixels, and we select each one of these voxels, we need to decide what type of tissue is represented in that voxel. In this case, as you can see here, this voxel contains, or this pixel in this case, because it's a 2D image, contains three types of tissues, CSF, gray matter, and white matter. So the software needs to decide how to label these voxels. And, and there are a couple of methods and solutions to address this. However, the most common ones or the ones that are concerning to us are these two. So on one hand, it is possible to label the voxel according to the probability of it being part of the gray, white matter, or CSF based on a common template. And the way this works is that you take your native or your subject's MRI, you put it on top of a common template, and then if the template tells you the voxel in this area is probably gray matter based on these statistics, then that voxel in your subject space is going to be classified as gray matter or white matter or CSF, depending on the probability of the common template. The other option is to trace the surfaces and inflate them into a sphere. So this way, you're kind of not measuring each voxel per se, but you're actually creating surfaces and measuring vertices and, and distances between the different points or the different vertices. And these two methods are what constitute or are one of the main differences between volume-based morphometry and surface-based morphometry. So in volume-based morphometry, which is what, for example, SPM or FSL does, is um, what it does is basically it has a probability map that they and they normalize the um, native space into that probability map and they extract the number of voxels that could and the probability of each voxel of being part of the different tissues. Running surface-based morphometry, such as which is what FreeSurfer and CAT12 do, and um, what it happens is that they trace the surfaces, and I'm going to show you an illustration on how that works, and they trace the surfaces and then they inflate them, they inflate the brain into spheres and then they measure the distances and the areas. And that's how they obtain um, the metrics. So um, this is what I'm talking about. So basically in FreeSurfer, what FreeSurfer does is that it starts using the um, gradients, the intensity gradients in throughout the tissue, it starts by creating or by tracing the white matter surface, which is this yellow line that you see here. And once it has that white matter surface, it will create, it will kind of create vertices. And from there, it will grow or it will expand um, up to the next uh, intensity gradient difference, which will be, which will correspond to the peel surface, which is basically the gray matter. And then once it reaches that section or that threshold, it will create the new, the new surface. So these surfaces are eventually extracted and, in, and each one of these points and kind of arrows will eventually create the mesh, which is um, you, if you read the free surfer documentation or you read about free surfer, you will find this term used quite a lot, which is the mesh, which basically means the surface is reconstructed into these kind of vertex and edges structure. Once free surfer has that, it will inflate the brain and the different colors represent the depth and the curvature and other metrics. And eventually it will inflate it to a point that it becomes a sphere. Once free surfer has this sphere, it will normalize the sphere into a common space. So a little bit similar to what um, VVM does, that is instead of they take the subject space and they normalize it into a template. And that is a basic a probability map. In this case, what free surfer does is that it takes this sphere and it normalizes into an average space that is called the Tylerx space. 
And this normalization into TaylorX space, what it provides or what it allows us is to being able to parcelate the cortex according to, to the reference space. So here's an example of what happens with different MRIs in free surfers. So basically the first thing is that you create surfaces and you inflate each subject brain into a sphere. And as you can see here, each sphere is different. However, once you have that sphere, you will normalize the sphere into a common space, which in this case are just, you're going to see later on is called the FS, FS average, which is also known as the Telerac space. And once each brain is normalized into that average space, a free surfer parcelates the cortex and extracts a bunch of metrics. I want to make an important point here, and is that given the differences between VVM and SPM and the way they calculate all these different metrics, the gray matter volume specifically in VVM is not equal in meaning to the gray matter volume in SPM. And this is something that you should have in mind when you read papers. They're a little bit different on how they're calculated, but the output is usually very uh, reliable. So don't worry about this, but just, just have it in mind when you read papers. The gray matter volume in, MBA, in VVM is calculated from the size of each voxel by the mean intensity inside each voxel or the overall voxel in, in, in case you're doing ROI and regional analysis. Whereas in SBM, what happens is that it, the volume is calculated from the area and the thickness. So it's a little bit different just for you to have in mind. The other thing that you should have in mind is that the thickness is basically the, the gray matter surface is built from the white matter. And this is how thickness is calculated in SPM. It's basically the average between the distance from the white matter to a gray matter and back. This is a very nice illustration that shows how the differences between VVM and SPM in BVM, you, as I was telling you, you have a probability map, and that probability map decides uh, if the voxel is part of the gray matter of the or the white matter, and the output of BVM is just volume metrics. However, in SPM, what you create is surfaces, uh, and then you inflate those surfaces, and based on the distances um, of those surfaces, you can create, uh, you can obtain different and actually more metrics. In SBM, you can obtain volume metrics, thickness metrics, curvature indexes, and areas. So in a nutshell, surface-based morphometry or analysis is things you have to have in mind is that the gray matter is built from the white matter. It's There are a couple of studies analyzing which one is more accurate in terms of the reliability and the accuracy of the metrics. And some studies show that surface-based morphometry is more accurate, has a more accurate measures of morphometry and better intersubject registration compared to VVM. Also, if you're working with cortical thickness or durification indexes, you should be using surface-based morphometry because the brain surface meshes permit that analysis and not the kind of voxel-based reconstruction of the brain. And finally, if you're uh, working with functional MRI or you want to see or, or illustrate functional activity, this one is better visualized on the spherical or inflated brain given that function follows surface. So again, this reconstruction, this surface-based reconstruction is more useful uh, for these. And just for a take-home message, if you're working or you just want to analyze volumes, then BVM or SBN will work fine. However, if you want to analyze or you're interested on thickness, area, or durification, you should be using SBM as this is the one that provides those metrics. Um, just an uh, additional illustration on the differences between VVM and SPM. So as you can see here, the kind of methodologic, methodological aspects behind each one of the processes are kind of the same. However, the way they do each one of these kind of sections is a little bit different. In BVM, we use a tissue probability map, whereas in SPM, we use a tissue parameter map, which is basically the inflated brain. 
Um, these are the common, the most common softwares used in neuroimaging analysis and the type of, of processing that they do. And just one additional illustration to show you the different um, metrics that you can obtain from both. As I said before, in volume-based morphometry, you basically get volumes, whereas in surface-based morphometry, you get uh, volumes, thickness, area, and curvatures. Um, just to clarify, this is something that you should have in mind. You probably have read and you probably have heard about VVM or VVA and SBM and SBA. And these terms are sometimes a little bit confusing. So VBM can also mean voxel-based morphometry or voxel-based analysis, or it can also mean vertex-based morphometry or vertex-based analysis. And what it means is that if you're talking about voxel-based morphometry, these are um, analyses made basically from the output of volume-based morphometry pipelines, given that the volume-based morphometry pipelines use and create this voxel-based um, or like these voxel maps. If you're talking about vertex-based analysis or vertex-based morphometry, you're probably referring or the author is probably referring to metrics derived from the surface-based morphometry pipeline, such as FreeSurfer. So if you do group analysis in FreeSurfer, the output or the way the, the, the term we use is vertex-based analysis instead of voxel-based analysis, because FreeSurfer, the reconstruction of FreeSurfer is into vertex, not into voxels. With SBM and SBA, it's just as the name suggests, it's just surface-based morphometry and analysis. Those are the characteristics that are make free surfer so special. Uh, but however, there's another reason like to love or hate free surfer, and that is that it uses the terminal and bash as the kind of language to process the images. And the reasons why this is useful or actually good is that it allows it is highly customizable. It allows for batch processing. And third is when you have um, the common when you pr uh, program and in common line or in bash, uh, you can replicate your analysis quite easily. You just basically basically save your code and run it again, and you can also share it with other people, and they will be able to run the same thing that you created or that you built. Um, and finally, it's easier for debugging. So now for those that are not very familiar with bash or command line, here is a short presentation. Um, an introduction to Bash that we I will encourage you to to watch, um, so you're more familiar with the terminology and the way we work or the way um, we access the terminal and some of the main commands that we use in Bash. Hi, this is a quick introduction to using the terminal and Bash. So let's start by talking about what a terminal is. Uh, this is a terminal from the 1970s, um, and it's how people interacted with computers before we had graphical user interfaces and fancy high resolution displays. So rather than interacting with apps, with buttons and widgets, everything happens in text. You tell the computer to do something in text by typing in a command, and in response, it just gives you more text. So it's a bit like using Siri or Alexa, except for rather than using a natural human language like English, you use a slightly more restricted and simple computer language. So this is a terminal on a modern computer. Um, it might be surprising to learn that we still use terminals on modern computers, um, given that terminals are half a century old. But there are a few good reasons for that. So at first, it turns out that text interfaces are really, really powerful, and they let you communicate complex ideas really concisely. So say, for instance, you want to find all of the documents within a project you're working on and count the total number of lines of or total number of words in all of the files and all of the documents. If you tried doing that with regular software right now, it'd probably be pretty hard. You'd need to, maybe there are Word documents, you'd need to open up every document in Word and look at the word count and then manually sum all the numbers, maybe using a spreadsheet or something like that. Whereas with the terminal, um, you could do that in maybe a minute or so using just a couple of commands. It'd be really easy. Secondly, it's, it's really easy for programmers to write programs that speak text, that accept text in and, and emit text out. Um, writing these complex graphical user interfaces is insanely time consuming. So if you're building uh, a program that I don't know, analyzes medical data or something like that, you want to spend your time as the programmer doing what that program does best, which is the analysis. You don't want to spend weeks and weeks 
building complex user interfaces, which then need to change every time you add a new feature. So there are just a lot of programs out there that only speak text, that only work via the terminal. So it's useful to get to know the terminal, um, even if you don't think you'll spend that much time in it. Let's quickly talk about some definitions. So the terminal, or terminal emulator, as it's kind of emulating one of these old terminals, is the window that you type commands into. Um, this works on most modern operating systems. And then bash is the language that the terminal speaks. So we'll talk a bit more about bash later. I'll give a demo and kind of run through how to use bash. To start out, we need to figure out how to open up the terminal on our computers. On the Mac, it's really simple. Um, there's a program called Spotlight where you can built into every Mac, you hit, you hold command and hit space. And this little window will pop up, you type terminal and you press return and everything will just work out of the box. On Windows, it's a little more complicated. I haven't used Windows in about a decade, so I'm certainly no expert, but you, I gather, need to open the start menu, type CMD into the search box that appears, um, find the command prompt. With Windows, we need to install something called WSL, which stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux. Um, we do that by opening this command prompt as the administrator typing WSL dash dash install into the terminal. And then you can install the Windows terminal from the Windows Store, which is a more user-friendly terminal. I would recommend watching this video here um, if you're using Windows, tinyurl.com slash win dash terminal dash setup. It goes through kind of in a bit more detail how to actually set this up and gives you a live demo. So now I'm gonna give you a quick tour of how Bash works. Let's start by opening a terminal. I'm on a Mac, so I'm gonna open Spotlight with command spacebar. And then I'll type terminal and hit return. So this is the terminal. Basically how it works fundamentally is that you type in a command and then you press return and then the command will do something and give you some kind of response normally. Uh, so if I want to know the current date and time, I can type date and then hit return and I get the date. If I want to see a calendar, I can type cal and hit return and I, I see a calendar. Um, or if I want to see how long it's been since I restarted my computer, I can type uptime. I can see my computer has been up for a little over a day. Um, a lot of commands can be given extra values by typing more things after the command name, separated by spaces. So for instance, I can type echo and then hello world. And then if I hit return, it will give me back just hello world. So just the two words that I gave to echo. These are called arguments. So you'll see a lot of references to command line arguments. This is argument one, argument two. Next, let's talk about files and directories because most of the time you're going to be running commands to operate on files. So as you probably know, files on your computer are structured as a tree. Every file lives in a directory and every directory lives in another directory all the way back up to the top. And the top directory is known as the root directory, R-O-O-T. And whenever you type a command into your terminal, it's important to remember that the command is running inside a directory. And sometimes that doesn't matter. So when I used echo before, it doesn't matter where I typed echo hello world from. It could be in any directory and it will give the same output. But if I'm operating on a file, so for instance, deleting a file, I need to know how to refer to it. So if I'm deleting a file in the directory I'm currently in, I can just refer to it, if refer to the file by name. But if it's in another directory, I need to use the full path to that file. So I need to tell the deletion command how to find the file to delete. Um, so when you start your terminal, you'll be in your home directory for your user. You can see your current directory by typing pwd. So let's do that now. pwd stands for print working directory. And if I hit return, you can see I'm in slash users slash hmr, where slash here is the root directory. And then this is the directory that contains all of the user directories. And then this is my user directory. So all of the directories are separated by slashes in the path. So what if I want to list the files within my current directory? To do that, I can type ls, where ls stands for list. Um, so I've got a bunch of other directories in here and I can tell the directories because they're blue according to the, the color scheme I happen to have activated. Um, but what if I want to change the directory I'm in? So say I want to go and work on one of these projects in the projects directory. 
to do that, I can type CD for change directory and then projects and then hit return. You can see the name of this directory is now at the front of this thing here, which is called my prompt. Um, and then I can type PWD again, print working directory, and it will show you that I've moved into this projects directory. So this is where I am now. So let's try deleting a file. So if I type ls again, we can see here that I've got an old file called notes.txt, which I don't need. I'm done with these notes. So to delete the file, I'm going to type rm for remove, and then notes.txt, and I'll hit return. And then let's type ls again to list the files. And you can see that that file is gone. So how do I get back to my home directory now? If we type pwd, you can see I'm in this projects folder. What if I want to get back to this home directory? Well, there's a special bit of syntax for that. You use two dots to refer to the directory above the one you're currently in, or the parent directory. So if I type cd space dot dot, and then hit return, and then pwd again, you'll see I'm back here in my home directory. So in this projects directory, there was a a folder called bash demo. I want to have a look inside that. So to do that, we'll use the ls command again, and we'll look inside the projects directory, but then we can type a full path here. So we can do slash. And actually, if I hit tab at this point, it will show me the options. Um, so I can type bash demo and then hit return. And so now we've listed the files inside projects slash bash demo. You can see there are two files here example script, which I'll talk about in a second, and to-do list. I'm actually already done with this to-do list. I've had a productive day, so I'm going to delete that one too. So to do that, I can just type rm project slash bash demo slash to-do list.txt. And then if I was to list that directory again with ls, let's type tip, uh, you'll see the to-do list is gone. So next, I want to talk about scripts. Sometimes you want to run the same list of commands over and over again. And rather than typing them out from scratch every time, you can save a list of commands into a file, which is called a script, and then run that script as a new command. So if you had five commands and put them in a script and then gave that script a name, like example script, you could just run a command called example script that would then run those five commands. So this is a useful way of not having to constantly type the same commands over and over again. So I'm going to first navigate back to this bash demo folder where I have this example script. To run a script in the current directory, you use dot slash and then the name of the script, example script. Um, before I do that, I'm going to show you what the script does so you can predict the output. So if I type cat, uh, which is short for concatenate, but is actually the easiest way of just showing what's in a file. So I'm going to type cat and then example script. You can see this script contains one use of echo saying today's date is, and then we call the date command that we used earlier, and then echo for a blank line. And then we're going to say echo the current user is, and then who am I is a command I can just run now, which shows oops, who am I. It'd help if I could type. So that shows who I am, and then we're going to run echo again for another blank line. So if we run this script, you can see it runs all of those commands sequentially one after another. So I'm now going to do cd dot dot and then cd dot dot again. So I'm back in my home directory. And if I run example script, it doesn't work. And if I run example script without the dot slash, it also doesn't work. So how would I make this work? What if I want to be able to run the script from anywhere on my computer? Well, we can do this by modifying the config file for the shell. If you're using a Mac, you might be using ZSH. If you're on Linux or Windows or another operating system, or even an earlier version of macOS, you might be using bash. And most of the time, this distinction doesn't matter. But in this case, it does, because the name of the shell is actually in the name of the config file. So we can find out the shell we're using by typing echo dollar and then shell, all in capitals. 
So you can see here, because it ends in ZSH, I'm using ZSH. If I was using bash, it would show me probably bin slash bash. So we're going to edit the configuration file for ZSH in my case. And the configuration file really just is a script, like this example script here is a script that's loaded every time your shell runs. So to edit it, we need a program that can edit text files. There are lots of them out there. There's one called Vim, which is very popular. There's another one called Visual Studio Code, which is much more fully featured. I'm going to use a very simple one called Nano. So I'm going to type Nano, and then you start with a dot. Um, the dot is necessary because the configuration file is technically a hidden file. Um, I'm not going to go into it right. It, I'm not going to go into that right now. But um, basically, any file prepended with a dot means that it won't show up when you type ls. So it's dot and then zshrc, um, and the bash equivalent is called bash rc, exactly the same. Otherwise, so then if I hit return, I'm presented with a blank file. So this has nothing in it right now. So what we want to do is modify a special variable that ZSH or bash uses to determine where its commands are. So anytime you run a command like date or cal or any of those, it will look for that command inside a series of special directories that contain programs. So we're going to add a new directory to that list of directories that, contain, that contains programs. So the variable is called path, all in caps. And to modify it, we need to type export and then path, all in caps, equals. So we're going to reassign this variable. Then we need some quotes. And then we're going to take the current value of path, which we do by typing dollar $path. This syntax might look a bit weird. Don't worry too much about this right now. You can just copy it as is, and it will just work. Um, and then we can use a colon. And then we can type in the new path. So I'm going to use slash users slash hmr, which is my user, slash projects slash bash demo. And then we need to close it with a double quote. Um, at that point, I want to save the file. And you can see down here to save the file using nano, we can use control O. So I'm going to hold control and press O. And then it's prompting me with the name. I'm going to hit return. And then I'm going to close the editor, close Nano with Control X, which you can see is down here. So hold Control and press X. So that's done. Um, however, if I type example script, that won't actually work right away because I need to reload the configuration file. There are two ways of doing this. The first and easiest probably is just to close the terminal and reopen it. But you can also type source and then dot zshrc. So that will have reloaded the configuration file. Now, if I type example script, you can see it ran the script. So that's it for now. Um, there's a lot more you can learn about Bash in the terminal, but hopefully this quick intro gave you enough to get started. And now that you have that, uh, that you are a little bit more familiar with Bash, we're going to start talking about the requirements uh, to download and to use FreeSurfer. So first of all, I'm not going to walk you through this. These are just kind of the things that you need that your computer needs to have in order to be able to run FreeSurfer. And I just want to make a point here, which is that the Macs that have the M1 or the M2 processor are not might not work um, with the software. So in case you have one of those of the new Macs, you need to install something that's called the VirtualBox. This is, if you check the free software documentation, you'll be able, to, they provide kind of the links and a kind of a step-to-step -step guide on how to install this VirtualBox. The other way is called the Rosetta. And with Rosetta, you can install a uh, free surfer and it works fine. However, if you're working with the Intel Max processors, that will be fine. And if you're working with Windows, again, it's fine. You just need to make sure to download the appropriate package and follow the appropriate steps. To download Free Surfer, you just have to go on their website and just download the program. Uh, you also need to get a license in order to run Free Surfer. And this is not, you don't need to do it before you don't load the server, you can do it at any point basically, but you need to do it before you start using FreeSurfer because you need to upload the license into your FreeSurfer folder. And I'm going to show you how to do that. 
And here's a cool video provided by this free surfer a team on um, how to unload and install free surfer. So for the ones that are using Mac, once I don't know if this is the same of this if this happens in Windows or Linux, so just bear with me. So once you download free surfer and you try to open it, you will get this message that says that you cannot open it. To overcome that, you just have to go into your settings, your privacy and security settings, and you'll see this box here that says that free surfer was blocked. Just click on the open anyway button and you'll be able to like open it and install it like as a regular program. Just follow the steps that free surfer gives you. And once it is installed, it will is going to create a folder in the corresponding path that you um, define. And you will see a folder called that's called Free Surfer, followed by the version of Free Surfer that you're going to be using, and then a couple of folders, and below that, just a couple of folders and files. So once you have this structure and once you have the program downloaded and all these folders here, you will need to get your license, which as I told you before, you obtain from this um, link here. Um, after you fill out the link or the form, you will receive an email with a document, which is an attached document, which is called basically license.txt. You have to download that document and save it into this uh, folder here at this level, not here, but here at this level. Um, and yeah, you save it and that's it. So now that you have Free Surfer in your computer, you need to tell your computer uh, where Free Surfer lives basically and the address to find it because uh, eventually you will need to kind of call Free Surfer and the computer needs to know where to go and find it. Um, so, and there are two ways of doing this. The first, the first way is basically every time you're going to use Free Surfer, you basically tell him, okay, my Free Surfer home is this one, and this is where my subjects are. Or the other way is to set the paths in your Bash or C, which you probably heard about that in the Bash um, video. Um, and you set the paths in your Bash or C, and basically your computer will read that document and will source it every time you log in. So you don't need to do it every time you're going to use Free Surfer. The way to source it in your Bash or C is by you just need to open terminal, then type um, v Bash or C, kind of using these characters here. This will open kind of a new screen. And in that screen, you will need to type these um, three things, these three kind of lines, which are the free surfer home. And just please type it exactly as it looks here. So export free surfer home in capital letters, no spaces. With this one, this path should correspond to your own path. So if you say free surfer in your documents path, this um, path should correspond to that to that path. Same for the subjects there. So the subjects there is the directory where you will have um, your subjects or your your files, your T1s, and etc. So this path should point to that folder. And then finally, source dollar sign free server home followed by this file. Once you've written that in your Bash RC, you just have to type escape followed by colon WQ, and that will save that will save and close your Bash RC, and you're ready to go. If you open a new terminal after creating your Bash RC, you will see that it will print out these um, your paths basically, showing that, and you should basically make sure that the path that is printing is the same or is the one you're expecting. And if it's not, then you can just go back to your bash RC, typing again V characters bash RC and just modify it. So now in order, so as I said before, you also have to, you have to write down or you have to um, define your subject directory. And I will uh, encourage you to use the bits formatting when you create or when you organize your neuroimaging data. 
So in my case, this is my bits formatted subjects directory. So as you can see here, I have a main level, which is subjects. You can also call this study one or whatever you want to use. And the second level will contain my the folders for the different subjects. And each folder or each, each subject will contain the source files, which are, which are basically the DICOM files, and an, an add folder that will have the um, T1 ne file for that particular subject. And the same will happen for the subject two, three, and four, and so on and so on. So in my case, I want to make sure that my subjects directory points to this level here, not this one or not this one. I want it to point to the kind of study uh, subject, the study folder, which in my case is called subjects. In order to check if that's the case, just go on your terminal I'll, and type echo subjects there, and it should print out the, the path to this folder here. If it doesn't, or if it's wrong, just you can modify it directly you can either modify it in your Bosch RC, or you can also modify it directly in your terminal. So for example, this is useful. For example, let's say you got a new folder or someone sent you a bunch of new data and it's in another folder that is different to this one here, and you don't want to modify your Bosch RC, what you can do, because for example, you're only gonna run a couple of, of recons all in that session. So what you can do is that in your terminal, not in your Bosch RC, you type subjects there equals to the path to your kind of new directory. And this, one, this command will change your the subjects there path for that single session, not the overall. So if you close that terminal uh, or you turn off your computer, the next time you open the terminal or you open your computer, the subjects there will point to the one that was defined in your Bosch RC. So if, again, if you change your subjects term inside terminal, not in your Bosch RC, the subjects there or the path will only be active during that session, not in the future and not if you open a, a different terminal. Um, so just have that in mind. So again, once you set your path, you can check if it's correct by typing echo subjects there, and this should print the path to these to this level here. And if you would just want to kind of jump uh, to that path or to that um, point or the, that that uh, directory, you just type cd subjects there, and you will be there. What's the type of data that you can use when to run FreeSurfer. So it's basically a T1 MRI that should be an MPH or an SBGR. And it can be either a 1.5 or a three Tesla. You can also process seven Tesla using FreeSurfer. However, you need to make a couple of adjustments to some of the parameters. And also some of the commands or like you can also use a T2 or a flare in, in FreeSurfer for a special, in a special kind of situations and cases. Now we're gonna jump into the kind of actual hands-on and we're gonna start talking about the main free surfer command, which is called recon all. Recon all stands for reconstruction all. So it's basically what the name suggests. It reconstructs the brain from zero, from the like raw T1 into a bunch of statistics and volumes and surface images. So recon all is composed of many different steps. In total, it's composed of 30 different steps that I'm going to talk about them in a bit. However, this is a kind of broad overview of what happens when you run recon all. The way you run recon all is by typing in your terminal the following command. So you start by typing recon all as it looks here without spaces, followed by space dash i space your input nifty image, the one you want to process, space dash s space the name of your output, the name and actual path of your output um, directory. And you can just give these any name you want. I sometimes use 
Uh, for example, if my input image is from subject one, then my output directory will be subject one free surfer or something like that. Um, and just make sure that that directory, that name has no spaces. Remember that when you're using bash, you cannot have spaces. Or it's better not to have spaces in, in the names. So just make sure that your output directory contains no spaces. Um, after that, you're going to have a space, dash all. And this all refers, basically it's telling recon all to run all the steps, all the 30 steps. Then space dot dash Q cache. And if you read the free surfer documentation or you know regular free surfer examples, you will see that this Q cache is not usually used. And the reason why I will basically my advice and my recommendation is to actually use that Q cache. And the reason is because the longitudinal pipeline needs the output of this cross-sectional. Q cache. This Q cache, uh, what it creates, I'm going to show you later, but what it creates is just basically different images with different smoothings. And if you don't run it at this step, and if you want to run a longitudinal analysis, you will need to run again the recon all using the Q cache before you're able to run the longitudinal analysis. So just basically try to run it if you're doing it, if you're running a cross section analysis, just run the Q cache in case you eventually will need the output. Free Surfer is not, is not fast. <laughs> um, and it depends, like it takes, it can take, it can take a long, long, long time. And it depends on the, this time depends on the characteristics of your computer and, you know, how fast your computer is and how much space you have and all that stuff. In slow computers, to say it somehow, it can take up to 16 hours. In my case, I have a Mac with an M1 processor, which is quite fast, and it takes four hours, which is pretty good. It can take even shorter amount of times um, when you're using high performance computer or when you're running it in parallel. So just have that in mind. I recommend if this is the first time that you're going to run Free Surfer, I will kind of run the command in the evening and just leave your computer on the whole night with the terminal running. And next day, you can just go back and check the output and you will be ready by then. So as I told you before, Recon all, all this one is composed of different steps. And these steps are actually subdivided into auto recons uh, subdivisions. So there are three main different auto recon subdivisions, and each one corresponds or contains different um, processing steps. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to run a recon all and how to basically just activate the command. So as you can see here, I have my, my study composed of a subjects directory, the subjects, the source files, which contain my DICOMs, and the anat folder, which contains the T1 nifty image. So I have that, and now I'm going to open my terminal. And the first thing I'm going to do is to check that I actually have free surfer in my computer. So first, I'm going to type free surfer. And as you can see here, I have free surfer, this text shows me that I have free surfer installed. Then I'm going to check my subjects. What's my current subjects directory path? And as you can see here, it's properly pointing to the directory that, I'm, that I want, which is subjects, as you can see here. Then um, I'm going to start writing my recon all command, which, so recon all. Then here is an important thing. So here, as you can see, you need to write or you need to point the path to your knee image. However, this subject sir is already pointing to this level here, to the subjects uh, level here. So after that, if I just leave it like that, if I just type here subjects directory, Free Surfer will go here to subjects directory, to this subjects folder, and will say, okay, 
this is nice, but I don't see any knee file at this level. So where is the knee file? So you need to tell you need to tell FreeSurfer that actually the knee file is in the subject's directory, but it has to go into a subject a file, into a subject folder, and then into the, the anat folder in order to find that nifty file. So you have to write something like this. Subject directory, subnum, sub01, anat, and then the new file, as you can see here. Then I'm going to define my output directory, and I, I want that output directory to be called, in this case, a free surfer, which is a bad name. I should have used a different name, but whatever. Um, then the dash all, which indicates that I want all the all the steps to be run, and then the queue cache. Now I type enter, and you see FreeSurfer started running, and it created my output directory here. I could have also created that directory inside my sub01 folder, and that's fine. And again, you can give this directory any name you want, and you're going to see that it creates a bunch of folders. Um, so yeah, you just I left this running overnight, and the next day, and oh yeah, basically what it's running, what the recon all, all is doing is running each one of these steps. And as I told you before, each step or each um, subdivision, how to recon one, how to recon two, and how to recon three, three is composed of different processing steps. It's important to have in mind that each one of the subdivisions will create a bunch of different images as like the ones that are underlined here are the images, are some of the images that each step creates. And also we're going to be talking about this later, but when you're doing corrections and when you're correcting the output, you need to kind of stand on the diff these different images to change or to modify um, the actual output. So we're going to be talking about that in a bit, but just have in mind that you need these images and the order of these processing is important for the corrections. Now, the recon all command is quite robust and it also has a bunch of flags that you can use to personalize your reconstruction and your statistics. For example, you can use alternative atlases FreeSurfer will use the Desik and Kiliani and the Distro Atlas to, for the parcellation of your cortical regions. However, as I said before, as I just said, you can also use different atlases. That depends on your analysis and what you're trying to, want to obtain. Second, you can also do, do segmentations, hippocampal, thalamic, and brain and subfield segmentations, and I'm going to show you how to do that. You can run longitudinal analysis using the longitudinal pipeline. You can also manipulate ROIs. You can create new ROIs and modify existing ROIs. And also, and also you can do or you can make personalized statistical files that will be useful for your statistical analysis. So here's an example on how to use alternative atlases. So here I'm using the, the geo. 2011 atlas for a functional analysis. So this is something that you can do. You can you just basically point um, instead of here when you use the FS, FS average instead of using the Telerac or the Desican, Desican, Calini or any other, you just go and select the other atlas that you're interested on in using. For the subfield segmentations, there are a couple of options. You can do either thalamic, hippocampal, and brainstem subfield segmentation. And you can either do it in a cross-sectional or a longitudinal in, in, like, pipeline. And the way you kind of run this command is depends on what you already have. So if you haven't run the all the recon all all, then you can just run the recon all all. It will create kind of the usual output, followed by this hippocampal two fields to one, and this command will extract or will create the subfield segmentation, the hippocampal segmentations. If you already have the recon all output and you just want to run a new um, processing to obtain the hippocampal two fields, you just run this without the all. Same and um, similar as I told you at the beginning as well, you can also use the T2's 
uh, for a couple of processing uh, commands. So in this case, if you want to use the T2 to improve your segmentations, you just add this flag here, and obviously you need to add the T2 nifty file here. You can also use only the T2 in case you only have a T2. And for the group analysis, this is the command that you should type to run it. For the longitudinal pipeline, the longitudinal pipeline is, again, is really powerful, it's really robust. And actually, there are some studies showing that you can run the cross, you can run a cross-sectional analysis using the longitudinal pipeline, and the outputs are a little bit more reliable and accurate. So just in case you're familiar with FreeSurfer and you want to do longitudinal analysis, please check the longitudinal pipeline documentation and make sure that you select the appropriate commands. So what the longitudinal pipeline does is that it creates, it basically runs a cross-sectional, like regular recon all analysis at each time point. And after that, it creates a template or an average between the time points. And then it kind of matches or register the two time, time points into that created template or created average, and it extracts the metrics out of that out of the, that analysis. In order to run the longitudinal pipeline, the output, the kind of cross-sectional output, needs to have the output of the QCache. And basically the QCache, what it is doing it is, is that it is resampling your data into the average subject and smoothing it at various full width halves max, which are basically different, the term we use for the smoothing. So as you can see here, without smoothing, this is a brain without, or an output without smoothing. This is an output with a 10 millimeter smoothing and an output with a 25 millimeter smoothing. And you need these different smoothings when you run the, to run the longitudinal pipeline. Now you can also manipulate ROIs. You can create ROIs from label files using this command here. So again, just go and check the documentation if you want to work with your kind of own specific ROIs. So now imagine we waited for the whole, we waited the whole night to check to obtain our output. So now I'm going to show you a video of my output and what you're going to see after you run the recon all um, command. So as you can see here, um, this is probably the next day after running. And I see at the end of my, in my terminal, I didn't close it. I didn't close my computer. I see that it started the day before at 2.30 PM and it ended that same day at 6.30 PM. So it took literally four hours to run in this case. Um, and at the end, at the final line is going to say freezer finished without error. This is important. This is something we're going to talk about in the troubleshooting section and just done. So um, we're going to check for that. And then, as I said, just you want to make sure that it finished without error and that it, that is done. Now I'm going to go to the output folder. And in this output folder, there's going to be a folder called scripts. And that folder is going to contain a recon all log, which is going to contain all this stuff that was printed in my terminal. And basically, it's going to tell you everything that was uh, run. And also, it's going to tell you that the same thing that it started at this time, finished it at this time, and it finished with or without errors. You're also going to have a bunch of folders that we're going to talk about what's included in each one of these folders with the output images and the output statistical files. What's in each one of these folders? So the free surfer output contains eight uh, folders. As I said before, the scripts folder contains the logs. And these logs are key when you're debugging or you when you want to know, like for example, if a subject fail, you want to go and check that log to kind of figure out why it failed. Also, if your contact, if for some reason you're you're um, having a lot of problems running a particular subject, 
and you want to contact the free surfer team to get some help, you need to find, you need to send them that log. So just know, just have in mind that if you're looking for the log, that's where it's, that's where you're going to be able to find it. The MRI folder contains the MRIs <laughs> and these MRIs or like the volumes, basically, these volumes will be, will contain a bunch of different images, the raw average and the orange uh, image or volume is the is native anatomical space. So the these volumes are going to have the exact same dimensions as your as the input image that you provided. Whereas these ones, the T1, the brain mass, the white matter, and the ASEG, will be in a confirmed anatomical space, and it will be in one millimeter isotropic and in corona. So. Yeah, so this means that these images were normalized into the average space. These images here, the T1, the brain mask, the white matter, and the ASEC will be the images that are most, most relevant to us because they are the ones that we're going to be using for the in the troubleshooting section. The ASEC image is one of the main outputs and it's the subcortical segmentation of like volumetric segmentation. So this file will contain all the segmentations for the particular volumes, for the particular subcortical volumes, the basal ganglia, the deep nuclei, the white matter, the great matter, etc. And this volume will also contain the segmentations of your hippocampus and your amygdala. Um, so yeah, it's an important volume, an important output. By the way, FreeSurfer, as you may have noticed, uses MGZ as suffix, as the format, as the imaging format. The MGC is unique to FreeSurfer. If you want to convert those MGCs into any format or any other format, you can do so by using MRI convert on your terminal. So you just basically type MRI convert this image into, for example, I type MRI convert brain mask dos, dot MGC space brain mask dot knee, enter, and that will convert this image into Nifty. Um, now in the surf that in the surf folder, you will find your surfaces and you will obtain the again the original surface, the white matter, the great matter, the inflated and the sphere for the left hemisphere and uh, an exact copy for your right hemisphere. So, so yeah, that's what's in this folder. In the label folder, FreeSurfer uses kind of a specific atlases to label their cortical regions for the cortical parcellation. And it uses the desican. There are many atlases that you can use. And I told you before, you can use, you can modify the atlas that you want to use in the example that I gave you before we were using this one here. But the kind of um, the one that FreeSurfer uses, the default ones are the Desican Kiliani and the Distro Atlases. And these are the files that you're going to see in this folder. So for the Desican Kiliani, it's going to be the APARC ANOT. And for the Destro, it's going to be the APARC A2009 ANOT. So um, these files contain the parcellations of the cortex. Now, in the STATS folder, you're gonna you're gonna see or you're you're gonna obtain all the statistical files, and this is literally just files, CSV, Excel files with numbers and volumes telling you the the volume for each, the metric, the volumetric measurement, the thickness, the area, or the curvature for each one of the labels and the regions that that you have that were labeled, and if you open if you try to open one of these files, you're going to see something like this that contains the each one of the regions or the labels that you're kind of depending on, obviously, on the file that you open with the um, coordinates, the volumes, and some other statistics. If you want to convert these files here into CSV or text or um, Excel or whatever, what you can do is that you use this command here, which is a park stats to table. Then you list the subjects that you want to convert. 
than the hemisphere that you want to convert because remember, PreSurfer divides all the files into left and right hemisphere. So you need to tell him yeah, you want the right or the left. Obviously, you can do this for both. Just type a right hemisphere first, follow, and then in you know after you run it, you run the left hemisphere. Then the measurement. Uh, in this case, I want to obtain the thickness, and then the name of the file of the output file. And in this case, what I'm converting is the is the apark uh, files. So as you can see here, I have some aparks here. So this command will convert the aparks file into tables, but you can also convert the ASEC or both into tables. I have created um I have my own script that obtains all these measurements that creates basically a CSV file that contains all the volume, wide matter, thickness, areas, and curvature measurements for both the left and the right hemisphere for all the subjects in my study. So if you want to use this script, you can use it. Obviously, you, what you need to do is just change your, um, your paths here. So basically type, change, copy these and change your path to a free server home and your subject directory and your, again, your subject directory here. And once you have it, you just run these as a regular batch file and you will obtain um, all these files with the corresponding statistics for each one of the subjects in your subjects directory. Now, the temporal folder, the TMP, is usually empty, but we use it for troubleshooting. So have that in mind. And the touch and the trash uh, folders, again, are usually empty. So, and we actually have never used them before. So just leave them as they are. Now, the visual inspection of your data. So as I told you at the beginning, it's very, very important to visually inspect your data always, always, always. So for example, if you just want to open an MRI, what you can do is that you open your terminal and you type preview subject directory and then point to the volume that you want to open. In this case, I just want to open the brain MGC. So I just, I just um, kind of enter that and free view, which is free surfers visual visualizer will pop out and it will show me the brain MGC, MGC with the MGZ, which is this one here. Um, however, if you want to, for the actual troubleshooting and like to actually check if Resurfer did a good job, you need to open more surfaces and more volumes. And those are the T1, the white matter surf, the white matter volume, the braid mask, the ASEC segmentation, and the white matter and the gray matter surface reconstruction. To do that kind of in batch, you need to type this command here. So free view, this V indicates volume. So free view, open these volumes, then open these surfaces here. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to do that. So using our output here, I type free surfer V. By the way, this slash here is basically something that I use to tell terminal that I am not done writing my command. This is just telling him like, I'm just gonna jump to the next line to write kind of to follow up my command. So don't run it yet, I'm still writing. If I do not type this, that, this, this slash here, terminal will think, okay, this is the command and it will crash because it will not know what's free view dash V. That's not a command, that's not a complete command. So yeah, just, just know that. Um, so here, so I'm gonna type preview. I'm gonna open all of my corresponding volume files here. I'm just gonna quickly jump here. My MRI, my white matter, my brain mask, and then I'm gonna open the surface um, files. And here, as you can see, I'm using a different color, both for the ASEC and for the um, surfaces. So all of them and then enter and the free view uh, window will pop 
app and it would load the volumes and the surfaces that I indicated using the colors that I indicated. So just wait for a while until everything loads. And so here is your 3D inflated reconstruction of your brain. You can just jump around, move around. You can here, you're gonna see all the volumes and you can select or unselect the volumes that you want to see, same for volumes and surfaces. You can also change the view, kind of the slides that you're looking at and also the view. Here in this section here, you're gonna be able to change kind of the format and other parameters for each one of the surface or volumes. And it's important that every time, like you just, if you want to change parameter or if you want to do some troubleshooting, just make sure that you're standing on basically the volume or the surface that is in bold is the one that you're going to be working on at that time. So if you change, if you want to change something in the right hemisphere pile, pile surface, then you need to have the surface in bold in order to change that surface. So as you can see here, I think I'm gonna increase here the thickness of that. And here, the thickness, as you can see here, if I increase the thickness, you're gonna see how it increases. Um, and that's just the line. That doesn't mean that the actual volume or statistics gonna increase. It's just, just visualization of the surface. Now, here you can, as I told you, you can change the view. If you're, for example, zoom in or zoom out a lot, or if you move your brain and you just want to go to like 0, 0.0, then you can use these arrows here. Um, and also very important is this box here at the bottom that contains all the coordinates and the intensities for each voxel. Uh, and the voxel you're standing on. So basically the RAS is the neurological coordinates. This will be different to the radi radiological coordinates. And um, these, the, these other coordinates here are for the MNI space and the um, TK registration mask. Um, here you're gonna see the, the volumes and the surfaces that you loaded with the first value will be the intensity of that voxel. So in this case, I'm gonna be, for example, if I stand here on a different voxel, it's gonna tell me, okay, that voxel here has, the brain mask has an intensity of 46, the T1 has an intensity of 46, it's the white matter has an intensity of zero, so it's probably not white matter, and the ASEC has an intensity of zero because the ASEC is basically the white matter labeled. So again, has an intensity of zero. Um, so yeah, that's important. Um, then. The other, the other kind of important information that you will see here is that these coordinates, so, so these coordinates will correspond to the Telerac space coordinates. So the um, actual coordinates of free surfer, which, so these ones are in native space and these ones are in conform or um, template space. So that's something to have in mind. Um, okay, so that's kind of the free surfer output. Now, Again, I'm just gonna show you a quick sample and I'll walk, I'm gonna walk through the important boxes in, in Freeview. So these are the main boxes, is basically the ones that you're gonna be using most of the time. This one here, as I said, contains the list of files that you loaded. This one will contain kind of the different formatting characteristics. This one here will change the, you can change the view or your slice. This box here is quite relevant and is the uh, these buttons are the buttons you're gonna be using for the troubleshooting. And we're gonna do that in a bit. And this one, as I was just telling you, contains the coordinates and the intensity of the different voxels um, that you're standing on. And basically if you click, ah, the other cool thing about this, I don't know if that was shown in the video, but the other cool thing is that when you're stand, I guess I can show you in the next video, but when you're stand, on um, a volume or a or a coordinate, it will print out the name of that of the label of that voxel. So if you're standing, you know, 
in in the hippocampus, it will say hippocampus. So that's cool. And basically, you want to make sure that that it's a hippocampus. You know, it's not that you're standing here in the white matter and it's not, it's not telling you hippocampus, then you know it's wrong and you need to fix it. Now, for the buttons. So um, these are the buttons that you're going to use be using the most. The most important one, I think, is the voxel edit button. button. If you click on this one, this window will pop up and it will contain these additional buttons. The ones that I use the most are the fill, the contour, and the color picker. Of those, the one that I use most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, um, is the fill tool, which basically is used to create or delete voxels. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, the contour tool is kind of a semi-automatic contouring finder that helps you when you're drawing uh, regions. And the color picker is to basically select if you're uh, modifying the ASEC or you want to create voxels, you want to pick, basically you want to make sure that you're picking the color. If you want to, for example, if you want to expand your hippocampus, then you click on it, you select the color of the hippocampus, and then you just add new dots or new voxels uh, where you want to expand your hippocampus to, to make sure it's it's segmented properly. And that's what you use, basically, a color picker. Now, troubleshooting. So there are two types, free surfer. It usually works quite well. Um, and the output of free surfer is usually okay. However, there are some cases that it has errors. You know, when you troubleshoot free surfer, you need to have it can be a little bit frustrating and it's intimidating because it's it's just so much sometimes that you don't know where to start or what to look for. So my recommendation is to create this kind of map in your brain. And you have to ask yourself the following questions. First of all, is it a hard or a soft error. A hard error is basically recon all widths before completing the pipeline. And this, your terminal will say, recon all finish with errors. The soft errors, on the contrary, are basically, or happen when free surfer, when the recon all finished without errors, it just basically says it finished without errors, but you go and you open your image and there's a bunch of errors and mistakes that you need to correct for. So that's the first question that you need to ask yourself. Is this a hard error or this is a soft error? If this is a hard error or failure, as I said, the processing is stopped before you expect. You need to go to a recon all log and it will message something like exited free surfer exited with errors. That if this is what's printed, it indicates that it was a hard failure. The reasons for these are usually permission issues. So you don't have access or you don't have permission for your on your T1 or the output folder or the free surfer folder or something like that. It could also be that you run out of space or that your input, your T1 has a very low contrast or has very significant brain abnormalities. How to fix this? First of all, go to your log and make sure and read what happened and what was the last step um, to kind of understand what could have wrong, gone wrong. Second, open the last image or the last file that it created to check the data quality and also check the data quality of your input image. Verify, again, the output of the last successful step. And if you're still not do not know or do not understand the error, you can email the free surfer team, but please make sure you send them the log, this log here, and the command that you use. Now, self failures. These are the tricky ones because are the ones that we need to actually work on and correct on the image itself. So if it's a soft failure, the terminal or the recon log all will say recon all completed without errors. However, that doesn't mean that the data and the output is 100% fine. So there are a couple, once you, if you see, like, again, you check, it says completed without errors, you go, you open the image, and you see there are a couple of, of errors, or the questions that you have to ask yourself are the following. First one. Is the brain mask and the skull stripping okay? Was the skull stripping not enough or too much? 
And the reason why this is important is because the gray matter surface, which is built from the white matter, is drawn in the next intensity gradient. So if there is a skull, the skull will be brighter. So free surfer will think that the gray matter, the next kind of highest intensity gradient will be at the skull level. So it will create the gray matter surface at the skull level, which is obviously wrong. So you need to correct this. Um, the reasons for this, a par partial volume in effect or an intensity normalization error. The second question is, are my surfaces okay? So is my white surface and my cortical or my gray matter peel surface okay? Are they, are, are they where they're supposed to be? If, if you see there are errors with the surface, you need to correct the volume. And I'm going to show you how to do this. Because as I told you at the beginning, this surface grows from the volume. So first, the first thing that is created in free surfer is the ASEC. And we're going to see that here in a sec. But the first thing that is created is the ASEC. And once the ASEC is created, then it starts, starts creating the cortex. So the cortex, the cortical surfaces are the last thing that free surfer creates. So if you see there's a, there's a problem with the surface, it's probably because there was a problem with the volume itself. So you need to correct for that. And, and the, second th the second important thing here is that if there's a problem with the gray matter surface, remember that the gray matter is built from the white matter. So again, you need to uh, correct the white matter in order for the gray matter to be fixed. And finally, some topological defect errors that I'm going to show you what they mean. So as I was telling you before, free surfer is composed of many different steps and each step provides a different volume. And these are the volumes that you need to be to what you need to work on in order to correct for different errors. So for example, if you have um, a skull stripping errors, you will need to correct this, the braid mask itself, which is created quite at the beginning. So if you correct for the brain mask, you'll need to run the auto recon all to implement those corrections. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. And same for the other types of errors that we're gonna find. Now, as I'm gonna show you this in a bit, but every time you fix your output, you need to kind of, in order to implement that, uh, that correction, you need to run recon all again but you do not need to run it from the start because that will just basically erase everything and create everything again. What you need to do is to run the auto recon level. So for example, if you modify the brain mask, you need to run the auto recon one, two, and three. If you modify, if you added some control points, you need to run the auto recon two and the auto recon three. If you added some white matter edits or some PL surface edits, you need to run from the white matter onwards or from the PL um, auto recon onwards and so on and so on. Now, there are some cases where you just do a bunch of corrections and you don't really know which one is which or what you should write. So Free Surfer has a kind of very useful command, which is the one that I actually use, which is the make all a command and it's basically it just goes back and sees and checks whatever was added and will run whatever is needed. So you don't need to say auto recon one, two, three, you know, you just make all and it will do whatever it needs to do. Now, some uh, points of caution. When making corrections, the volume that we're correcting must be highlighted in free view. So as I show you in one of the videos, you need to have kind of that. The, basically the, the volume or the surface that is in bold is the one that you're gonna be working on at the moment. So just make sure that when you're making corrections, if you want to correct the brain mask, the brain mask must, must need to be in bold and highlighted. Second, never edit the T1, never, never. Ever, only edit the white matter or the brain mask. And sometimes very rarely you'll need to, to edit the ASEC, but the main ones are the, a white matter and the brain mask. Third, do not do unnecessary editing. Just focus on the ROIs that you're interested in. And it shouldn't take you more than 30 minutes per subject. To be fair, once you get like the gist of it, you will take it will take somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes per subject to basically check that it's fine and that everything is okay. 
Um, if you see that there are systematic errors, don't waste your time doing one by one. Just instead of just run recon all again with different parameters. For example, if you see that all subjects have still a lot of a score, you can use a specific command to just basically run all of them again with a more um, kind of a strict score stripping. Finally, the regions that where the free surfaces are not intended to be accurate, these areas will be the hippocampus and the amygdala. And the hippocampus and the amygdala are not taking into consideration in the surface calculation under we don't obtain like thickness measures out of the hippocampus or the amygdala. We obtain volume measures. And the lines that you're going to be look, seeing are surface lines. So don't worry, don't worry about these, the accuracy of the surfaces in, in these regions. That doesn't really matter. Nothing is taken, nothing is being calculated out of these regions in terms of surface or thickness. And um, the important part here is to make sure that the ASEC, which is the volumetric segmentation is correct. Now, what to fix and how to fix it. So as I told you, I just told you, the volumes that you're going to be fixing most of the time will be the Brady mask or the white matter mask. And the way to fix each one of these is by either erasing voxels, filling voxels, cloning voxels, or adding control points. And again, just make sure you're standing and that you're correcting the file that it needs to be corrected and that you're implementing the appropriate kind of command to correct for them. Now, the most common errors and how to fix them. So for example, you open your image and you see that there's too much skull was removed, even you know some part of the gray matter was removed or not enough skull was removed. In this case, you're gonna open the brain mask as you see here, and you're gonna either clone uh, some voxels from your T1, or you're going to erase voxels uh, from the brain mask. Once you've done that, you just basically save your, your corrections and you go back to your terminal and you type recon all uh, out to recon three or out to recon through two and three, depending on what you modified. Now, sometimes it's easier to just make the skull stripping in case too much was removed or too little was removed over like in general sometimes it's easier to just change the um, the um, threshold for the skull stripping and for that you're going to be using a watershed and higher watershed means less skull strip so overall for example if you see that most of the subjects have uh, tons of skull uh, that was not removed or that was too much or that too much was removed, you basically you can just go back and change this watershed to um, and that will be applied to all of the all of the subjects. These errors are easier to detect in the sagittal and coronal views. Now sometimes it's okay to leave some skull. So if you're working, for example, if you're basically interested in the hippocampal and the amygdala volumes and you see that some skull was left uh, in the parietal cortex, then you don't need to worry about that. You just can leave it like that. That's not affecting the segmentations of the areas you're interested in. So again, sometimes it's okay to, to leave some skull. And, and this is video shows you how it's going to look like and how to fix it. So as you can see here, I'm going to open my volumes. I'm going to make sure that I'm standing in the brain mask. I open my voxel edit, and as you can see here, I'm just gonna rewind this a little bit. There's some skull here, and the gray matter surface should, instead of going all the way up here, it should go up to here. So, and this happened because the intensity, kind of the next big intensity jump between this white matter and the next high intensity or like big intensity jump was between these and these. So that's where the piles, PL surface was created. And as you can see here, there's some skull here, there's some skull here. Uh, but however, this one, for example, is not affecting my segmentation. So I don't care about this one too much. But anyway, so let's, let's see how to fix them. So you select the voxel editing. You select the fill voxel or the erase voxel. Um, as you can see here, this one is the one that is highlighted, the erase tool. And I just go back and forth through all my images. 
and select the skull that I don't want to be that I want to erase. And after that, I'll just go and click here, and that will save my edits into a file. And after that, I will go and I will go and check my basically I will run the recon all command and I will check my output and it should be fine. Now, the next one is segmentation errors. So there are two types of segmentation errors. One is white matter classified as non-white matter or gray matter classified as white matter. So basically the surfaces are wrong or the segmentation, the ASEC is wrong. And the solution here is to fill or erase voxels in the white matter or to add control points in the white matter. And I'm gonna show you how to add control points because that's kind of, it's a common way to fix this uh, problem. Um, if you feel or erase voxels, you just need to run this command to implement uh, the edits. Or if you have control points, you just run this command to implement the edits. Now, segmentation errors are basically one of the main causes is that the intensity normalization was not done properly. So FreeSurfer, the way FreeSurfer decides if it's white matter or not, is by the intensity of the voxel. So if the voxel is around 110, it will be classified as white matter. And sometimes there are some voxels that are, for example, 100 or 95 or something like that. And FreeSurfer needs to decide, decide is this a white matter or is it gray matter? So Sometimes it should be white, white matter, but it's actually classified as gray matter, and that's when we need to, to fix it. So control points, as I was telling you, indicate voxels that are white matter, but are not classified as such. And it's useful when, when you want to recover like dark, thin, white matter strands and areas with very bright intensity. They're not good or not used for normalizing brain lesions or when white matter edits should not, and in this case, white matter edits should be used instead. And you should definitely, you should put them or add them in areas that are definitely white matter regions and not the cortex, the cerebellum, the brain mask or outside of the skull, obviously. And white matter voxels, uh, you should add them in voxels that are between 85 and 109 usually, and obviously just kind of, decide if that should be a white matter or if it's a gray matter. Um, how to create the voxels, here are the step-by-steps. I have a video on how to, showing you how to do it. To implement, just use this command. And some tips, use few control points and just spread them out in the problematic area. Uh, and yeah, so here's a video on how to do it. So first of all, as I was showing you, you need to be standing on the white, on the brain mask, sorry, for the control points. So here, the first thing is that I'm checking and um, I'm gonna zoom in my brain and then I'm gonna probably unselect the ASIC because I, it's a little bit confusing when you're adding control points. Then I'm gonna stand on my brain mask and I'm gonna check my brain for areas that I think that should be classified as gray matter, as white matter, but are not. Um, so I'm just going back and forth, doing a quick check. And for example, here, I think these voxels here should be white matter. So here I need to check in the T1, the intensity of this voxel, and it's telling me that it's like 92. So I actually think this is a, a little white matter strand that wasn't um, labeled as such. So I'm probably gonna add a control point there. And now I'll just continue checking my brain. Once I'm kind of familiar with it, I'll just go and say new point set. And then I'm gonna give this point set a name. This is gonna be in this case control without L, <laughs> sorry for the typo, the that, and I'm gonna make sure it's in my brain mask. Now you're gonna see this file was created here. And uh, again, I'm gonna make sure that I am standing on my brain mask. And again, I'm just gonna go back and forth, checking all the areas and I'm gonna add these green points are the control points. That one it was a mistake, so I deleted it. But for example, if I continue, I'm just gonna go and check and add control points where I see that they should be added. So for example, there is one there. I'm gonna add a couple of I think I added, no, not yet. 
So same. So for example, here, I noticed that this area here should actually, I don't think this is just gray matter. So I think this must be, there must be some white matter here. So and if I check the intensity, it's actually right there kind of in the limit, but I think it should be white matter. So I just added a con control point there. Um, and yeah, so basically I just continue. I will go back and forth. I check my decisions in different, using different volumes and different views. And once I'm ready, I will just go to save that file. I go to file, Let's see, I'm gonna finish, yeah. So I go, once that's kind of ready and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my, my decisions, I go and type save point set and basically just added the name, the same name, but, Oh, sorry, I made a mistake there. So save point set, and you just have to make sure that is you click here on control points and that you save it in the, not, not there, but in the free surfer temporal file. So in the one that was created for your subject, you just go to your subjects directory, which it's here. You open the free surfer. I re remember the one that you created. Again, I should have used a different name here, but water. Now here in the temporal folder, folder, I'm going to save this file control points in the temporal folder. Here I'm going to click yes. And then I'm going to go to my terminal and, and I'm going to run the out to recon. Oh, by the way, so if you try to type on your terminal and free view is open, you're not gonna be able to. So you need to close free view in order to be able to type on your terminal. So that's why like you see this here basically. Anyways, so once I'm in my terminal, I'm gonna type recon all my subject, the one that I just modified and the implementations, the command to implement my control points. This gains these two, then I had some errors there. I think it was just some sourcing errors, but finally I, I because I was typing, I was not indicating the correct um, subjects directory. So as you can see, you know, I still get some, some errors like that. So just don't get frustrated if things <laughs> don't go the way you expect at the beginning. It happens quite a lot. Then I opened the image and I kind of saw, make sure that the control edit was done properly. Now, finally, for some topological defects, these are basically holes or handles in your reconstruction. Uh, these are quite weird. I think I've had a couple in the past. Um, they're because of partial voluming defects and the way to correct for them is just fill voxels or erase voxels in your white matter and then run these command to implement the edit. Now, here's a list of other possible errors that you can find in your recon status log and the way to fix them. I'm not gonna walk you through them. Just, I'm just gonna leave them there in case you, in case your log has something like this, like error fob or fixed topology or skull stripping or something like that. This is what's happening and this is what you should be doing to correct for them. Finally, there's these, uh, the free software documentation has kind of like an extensive uh, section on troubleshooting with some examples and ways to fix them. So I would encourage you, if you're having lots of troubles with a particular subject, just I'll encourage you to just go and check documentation and make sure that you're doing and implementing the correct commands. And I just want to finish by thanking my team and Mount Sinai for sharing the, letting me use these images for this workshop. I hope you understand a, a little, a free surfer a little bit better now and that you, you're going to be able to use it more and more often in your studies and your research. Thank you very much and good luck.